Welcome, my name is Mai Muatao. I am the Youth Program Specialist here at St. Paul Neighborhood Network, SPNN, or SPIN for short. Um, I primarily work with the youth, and you will see three of our wonderful youth members working the cameras today. Um, our youth program focuses focus on helping the uh, youth in St. Paul learn media skills, and that um, involves um, filmmaking, photography, videography, and et cetera, et cetera. So tonight, we're very excited to have them be working on this panel. Uh, and we're very excited to have three very, very wonderful guests here tonight for our Leading Woman Artist Panel in celebration of Women's History Month. Um, so let's give a round of applause for our very, very amazing guests tonight. Mm -hmm. I will have each of them introduce themselves. Should I start? Okay. Hi, I'm Pa. Uh, I am a visual artist uh, currently living in Blaine. Um, and I'm also an educator at the University of Minnesota. My name is Marlena Miles. I am a Spirit Lake Dakota artist living in St. Paul, Minnesota. I create my art digitally and then I export it into lots of different mediums from murals to augmented reality to fabric to book design. So yeah. thank you for having me. My name is Amalke Kubad. I am the designer of Yo Mama, Yo Mama's House, and Yo Mama's The Art of Mothering Workshops. I predominantly work with mothers. I'm lifting the voices in the invisible and visible labor of women as essential workers and first responders. So that was happening far before 2020. Um, I'm a writer. I playwright. I do puppetry. I do weaving. Um, and I have a um, I'm beginning to do things with uh, crafts now, which I really, really love using my hands. So thank you for having me here, and glad to make my community larger. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, these three are super wonderful artists um, who have done really amazing work within their own communities, but within the Minnesota community at large. Um, so let's just get right into it. Um, can you all talk a little bit more about the work that you're doing and how you got there in the first place? And anybody can start. Okay. <laughs> um, I was an educator uh, for almost 40 years, and uh, it was an ECFE classroom, an early childhood fa uh, family uh, education class. I was the coordinating of the program, um, and we were looking at trying to get children five, you know, five and under ready for uh, the academic world. So one of the sessions I did with mothers was to say, oh, let's, let's keep, keep this imagination and, and this creativity going with our children and, and see how you can do that. Don't, don't, don't stop it because when they go to school, they're going to stop art. So keep them doing art and being creative. And I put a lot of things on the table like pom-poms and glues and popsicle sticks and paper and scissors and glitter and clay. And I'm talking about you know creativity and I'm talking about how children are brilliant as they are. And I'm noticing the mothers are not paying any attention to me. They're all like, oh yeah, you do this and you do that. Hey, show me how to do this. And I had like four different languages going on in this. So I had interpreters and I had all these women from all these different places and ethnic groups and all around the world. And they were just really enjoying themselves. So finally I just said, hey, I don't have an audience here what's going on and they said we really like doing this and I used to want to do art and I used to do this and I used to do that and my mom taught me this and my grandmother taught me that and I thought wow that's something what would happen if we did something where we could do this all the time and they said we come we'd come so that was the first kind of like aha that's kind of interesting because they were really in a groove and they were you know exchanging information on top of their children and the children were being nurtured and they love that um, Went to Summit Academy OIC, met a parent there, said, why are you here? She said, I'm taking this class, Community Health Work. And I thought, let me go see what that's about, because I'd like to you know, connect people and give them information. I ended up taking this class. It was a 20-week class. I had no <laughs> desire to be a community health worker. And I thought, why am I doing this? So there was an older woman there who was so nervous and anxious, she was literally pulling her eyelashes and her eyebrows and her hair out of her head. I mean, she just and I was like, oh, uh, you're pretty anxious, you're pretty nervous. Uh, maybe you should do some art. And she says, I do do art. And I said, okay, well, let's do some more art. <laughs> and, and she and I could never get the computer. We were like computer illiterate. So we were there to like, they shut us the door down and threw us out. And she brought these paintings that she did on brown paper bags. Mm -hmm. She took fingernail polish or crayons or whatever she could find and she'd make this art and she'd tell her stories. And she was selling these bags for like $5 or just giving them away. But you're giving away your life here. So I came up with her and said, look, if I got you out there 
would you trust me to do this for you? So I said, I have this idea about getting together with women and doing art-based stuff. So she and I were the first real mamas. Uh -huh. And we sat at Juxtaposition of Art. She had to do five, 100 bags, and I was trying to finish up my first book. And we would sit there, and other people would drop in, and we would do different things. She produced 100 bags, and we presented those bags at, uh, at uh, Mark Dayton's uh, uh, some kind of uh, consortium on ending poverty in 2020. Mm -hmm. And she had a table probably longer than this rug, and we had the bags on there. People left talk, listening to him and bought those bags, and people mm -hmm. were literally drooling over those bags, crying over the bag, seeing their stories in them. I said, you got to do this. So I went to the organizer and said, look, what's going on in here? And they offered her and I think five other artists a micro grant, and they opened up the art shop at Global Midtown Global Market, which is still going on. And she's gone from being homeless, pulling out her hair, getting her surgery together. Uh, she's my only, and so Yo Mama was developed out of that. Um, somebody on the internet kept saying, Yo, yo, I think yo, I got these mamas, Yo Mamas, and somebody said, What's Yo Mama? And so we started talking about it, and that became the name. So now, tw 10 years later, your mama has been international. We, that same person sold two pieces of art. She didn't even sell the art. They, they were on the wall in this gallery, and this woman walked up and just took them off the wall and said, these are mine. Mm -hmm. So she ended up doing her international sales. Um, we have an artist in Cuba. We have an artist in, 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 in Africa that we try to you know, support as much as we can. And your mama's house will become, um, what do you call it, incorporated very soon. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to have a registry of artists, which I have, um, and just send people out and connect women. But the bottom line is connection, mothers, mothering, older grandmothers getting skills down there. So we've done everything from crocheting to body casting to writing to dancing. We've been in the prisons, uh, Youth Link. Uh, we go everywhere there are mothers and mothers program and, and provide art. So that, that's what your mama's house is, and that's what mm -hmm. I've been doing. And, um, I'll just quickly, lastly, I also get pulled into just the, the community needs that people don't know. I don't know what to do, let's go ask the Maki. Well, right now I'm working with uh, Ashboro uh, Infestation of Trees in North Minneapolis, and it's a huge mess. So um, we do, you know, mothers call, they get some, and we show up, so that's mm -hmm. what I do. That's amazing, something so powerful from paper bags. Like, yes. That's mm -hmm. mind blowing. But how did you two start on your art journey then? Um, I guess growing up in Minneapolis as a kid, I lived at Little Earth, which is a Native American urban community, and I attended a Native American magnet school called Four Winds. Mm -hmm. And outside of that area, um, I never really saw anything that showed that this was Dakota homelands, and that is what Minnesota is, um, that's what Minneapolis is, and, um, you know, as an adult, I wanted to create the things that I felt like I lacked as a kid, like I didn't have authentic coloring sheets, I didn't have access to plant knowledge or star knowledge, or I didn't understand like the meaning of the places around us, you know, and if I didn't understand that, then certainly a lot of other people lack that um, educational knowledge. Um, they didn't really teach us these things in school. My school um, classroom, you know, that was like 99% native. Uh, I remember in fourth grade, they took us to Fort Snelling and they taught it to us as if it was like pioneer days. Here's what an old mm -hmm. classroom looks like. Uh. Here's what blacksmithing looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's literally the place of exile of mm -hmm. Dakota people, mm -hmm. you know, in eight, after the eight, War of 1862. Um, you know, it's the reason why my reservation is in North Dakota. My great great grandmother, you know, she was born in 1863, and, you know, that's while her mother was pregnant, I can imagine, you know, she's forced to be exiled, you know, and if she, it took like a hundred years for my mom to be like one of the first in her family to leave the reservation to come back to Minneapolis, you know, and that whole cycle of, um, you know, the return of Dakota people, um, you know, I want to use that as like a, a source of power and strength in the work that I create, so. Um, you know, I create like the Dakota Land Map series. Of, I've started with Minneapolis and St. Paul because that's what I knew most um, as an urban native, I guess. And I created that just because I felt like there was things lacking. I work with my friend Dawi, who is a Dakota language teacher, and we have this passion of sort of rebelling against the current system, not playing along with it, and just kind of creating our own sort of rules to make things happen because 
it would take a whole lifetime to try to change the system, you know, mm -hmm. and why do that when I can just go around the system to do what I want to do? Mm -hmm. And so those land maps, they teach the past and the present and also the future of Dakota um, because it has historical places, but it also has modern places. Because like I thought, you know, when I look at the light rail, why can't that be thought of as a Dakota thing? And so we gave it Daco the Dakota translation on the map, you know, yeah. because like I said, as a kid, I didn't see anything that showed this was Dakota homelands. But if I just give it name from our language, you know, that would change that mentality. Um, and so those land maps, we just give them out for free. People can order prints on my website, but, you know, I didn't know who wanted them. I didn't know where they're going to go. And so they've ended up in places like Starbucks. They've ended up in so many schools from elementary to college. Um, Harvard and all these places have copies in their libraries, places I never even imagined when I created it. So, um, you know, once I realized that my art can have an impact, um, you know, that sort of empowered me to create more learning materials, um, give them away for free, um, and also visit classrooms um, so that people of all different nationalities and ethnicities or whatever can see what a Dakota person looks like because, you know, um, I remember when I worked at my first job, uh, there was a little girl walking by with her dad and she's like, hey dad, dude, do the Indians, do they have kids? Like she's never mm. seen any photographs of that, you know? Or um, when I was at um, the Minneapolis Institute of Art walking through the Native Art Gallery, the little girl was like, hey dad, what's a Native American? Because they just all started going through that. Um, so like what I think should be like basic knowledge is not like well known, mm -hmm. so. Um, and so right now, you know, I create the educational materials on my website and then I do public art because, you know, I want to make sure that our art is seen everywhere, not just in museums, not just taught in the classroom, but because this is our homelands, you should just see it as if it's, you know, a normal thing, like the rugs should be seen as Dakota, billboards could be in Dakota, like there's really no limit of where we should be. And so I create public art, public murals, and then I started to do augmented reality, which is like a lot of people play Pokemon Go with their phones and they've seen like the little Pokemon characters show up in different places. Um, and so I use augmented reality to activate the Dakota stories that are land site specific. Um, and because I'm not disturbing the site or anything, I don't have to ask for permission to tell these stories that are there a lot, that are a lot older than whatever is currently at that location. Um, and so you know, people are able to immerse themselves and see the world from a Dakota perspective because our stories, they're here, but they're hidden to a lot of people. And I feel like the augmented reality really activates um, the stories that are there. And, you know, people reach out to me after they've done, like, the Dakota Spirit Walk, which I have at the Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary. People afterwards, after they experience meeting the four Dakota spirits there, you know, they tell me that you know, how can we clean up this place? Or how can we contribute more? Or, you know, where can I learn more of these stories? Because it's like, and they tell me too that they see the plants in a different way. They start seeing the world, um, you know, as, as relatives, seeing animals as relatives, seeing how the history is still connected to today. So, um, I mean, I never really thought this stuff could happen in my timeline, but, you know, I'm always just experimenting with ways that I can connect with more and more people because you know, I think if this is Dakota Homelands and everybody should be a little bit Dakota, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing. Um, yeah. To quote what you said, like, the stories are there, but they're hidden. So I'm, I think, like, as a younger generation artist, like, I'm very, um, it's a privilege for me to even be in a space that has so many BIPOC artists nowadays, right, compared to what you guys may have seen in the past. But thank you. Yeah. And Pop. Yeah. Um, so my story is very traditional in the sense that I went to an art school for an undergrad and then I went to an art school for un for my graduate program. But I would say like even before that, right, like I um, have always wanted to tell stories and I think that comes from like my father um, telling me stories um, and uh, like listening to his uh, tape recordings of folklores that he would tell us, me and my sister. Um, and like, you know, so my, my mom and dad both um, came to America um, from Laos and they were refugees and um, 
you know, in, for them in order to survive here in the United States, they often had to work multiple jobs. Um, and so it would be, you know, first shift job and then a second shift job, and then they would have an overnight job. And my sister and I would never get to be home with my parents. And the only way in which we would connect with my parents would be through these tapes that my dad would record for us, stories that his uh, mother and his grandmother recorded, uh, told him, right? And so I think from a very early age, I knew that I wanted to be a storyteller. Um, and uh, I think like for me, like as a Hmong American growing up in America, I thought that the fastest way to do this was could be through um, writing, right? But also um, English is not my first language. And so writing became really hard and I think um, really early on in, um, in high school, I discovered photography um, and uh, sort of the magic of photography and how uh, universal photography can be. Um, and, uh, you know, and so that was always like in the back of my mind. Um, and it wasn't until uh, uh, um, junior, um, like, uh, community college that I discovered photography in such a profound way, right? And this was through the um, photographs of Wing Young Huey, who was having an exhibition in um, at the Walker Art Center, and this was his Frogtown series. And you know, and so the Frogtown series consists of him walking in the Frogtown neighborhood, making photographs of the community that was there at that time. And that community that was there at that time largely was a refugee among Southeast Asian community. And, um, you know, for the first time I saw, like, photographs of my people um, made in a way that uh, told stories that I, like, I was interested in. And then also, like, I saw, like, literal photographs of my people, right? Like, he photographed my grandmother, he photographed my aunts, he photographed these parties that my like my family had, right? And so there was something about that that for me like felt um, like it was like the stories that I wanted to tell. And I think um, from there on I decided that I wanted to be a photographer. Um, and like I didn't want to be a, a like I was a very keen on being a very specific type of photographer and uh, you know, the kind that uh, Wing Young Huey was. And so, um, yeah, just sort of threw everything that I had into that, you know, and also I think that like being an artist in the Hmong community and being an, an artist from a family that is like a refugee family um, uh, can be quite challenging too because uh, my family and my parents, uh, you know, are very much still uh, operating on like survival mode, right? And so like you can't survive on an artist's salary. And so um, it was really hard. And I think in some ways it's still really hard. But um, yeah, I just like, I can't imagine myself doing anything else than mm -hmm. like, than what I'm doing right now. And uh, I, yeah, I, I love that. I can also speak to the whole like being a part of an immigrant refugee family and how difficult that is like trying to be an artist. Um, I'm the eldest daughter in a Hmong family and here like you know I have like a stable job like teaching youth but I'm also like trying to make my own art and it's just like how difficult it is trying to balance that understanding of like yes like there are bills to pay yeah. but also there are stories that I want to tell. Um, so then going off of that like what are the challenges that you find in your work um, but what also continues to affirm you in the work mm. that you're doing despite those challenges? Mm. You can start. Mm. The challenges I've had um, are I really don't see any systems or institutions who really value mm. women as mothers. Mm. So the other side of that is when I walk into a space and they want me to speak about whatever, I challenge the women in the audience to, to take to, to put on their mom's panties. Put your mom's panties on. Put your mom's hat on. You came to, you know, you didn't arrive here naked. You came here mm -hmm. after feeding somebody or dropping some kids off or whatever. So you've had your job of going before you got here. Own that mm -hmm. and bring that voice to the table in whatever work you're doing. I mean, it's great to have the, you know, the PhDs, you know, mm -hmm. piled higher and deeper. BS, what it sounds like. MS, more the same. You know, the bottom line, you can have all of that. But if you cannot have a voice 
or a clear mission of why you're here as a human being mm -hmm. and you cannot connect to other human beings is why you want to be on this planet, especially in these difficult times that we're having right now, um, it's your mom that pulls that together. I don't care how many, you, you go, you know, you call. I didn't have a mother. So my whole thing has been like, what is this mothering thing and what, is, how, what does that mother do? So I basically had given other people what I wanted to have. So I wanted to have those colored connections. I wanted to have those late night conversations. I wanted to have those that, that, that snot sling and cry with other people. I wanted to know what other people were doing. How did your mama do it? So all my girlfriends, I made sure they had mamas. So that I could say, well, how did your mama cook that? And I, you know, so I learned how to cook by tasting. You know, oh, I went over to her house and it tasted like this. So I might've got the ingredients and I had to figure it out because I didn't want to tell anybody I didn't know how to cook. Or you want to, um, I was a mimic. I mimicked everything. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to do things, but it was probably would be easier had I had that adult woman that mothered mm -hmm. me. So I make it really, t t I want women to know when you are mothering, it's the most important job on the planet. Not a human being would be here without one. Mm -hmm. So claim that. Hold, hold your chest up, hold your head up, and you're not ever say in front of me, I'm just a mother. Mm. You know, I'm, I know I don't want to hear it. So I talk to a lot of women around the world, and we are yoked by the violence of men, and we're yoked together by our babies. Mm. So we have to figure out, baby brings me joy, violence does not bring me any joy. So where are we going to go with our voices and our work? So my, I love that I tell women, even though maybe you have not had a, a, a birth a child, you birth ideas, mm. you birth energy, mm. you birth compassion, you birth curiosity. You birth something. You make right. somebody's day better every day. So those are the messages I'd like to get. And I'm finally beginning to people are beginning to understand that. Yeah, ask a mom. You know, ever ask a man for direction? <laughs> you ever try to give a man a direction? <laughs> oh my God. They won't take it. <laughs> you know, so we have to figure out, go to the person who does all this stuff, like, like a magician, we're juggling, we're juggling, we're juggling, we're juggling. Um, I used a woman's story that's from Clint, Michigan, who stood up in front of about a thousand environmentalists, mostly white males, mostly elite, you know, they, they were privileged. And she said, I cooked a pasta dinner with 40 bottles of water. The men at my table were like, 40 bottles of water? Wow, what do you need? What kind of pasta was she cooking? I said, let me tell you what goes into a pasta dinner. I said, yeah, some of that water is going into the pot. But little Junior comes in all muddy. She got to stop cooking to wash him down, wash his little butt, wash his hands. Then here comes the dog tracking something through. You got to mop the floor up again. Then little Junior's all cleaned up again. Now he knocks something over. You got to clean that up. I said, you're using a lot of water. Then you, who's up here at this table now, you wanted your shirt done a certain way. So she had to stop to do that and throw that in the washer. Make sure it comes out and gets to the dryer. Hang it up so you can be here today to talk about, I don't know what, 40 bottles of uh, water and pasta goes. You don't even understand the rudiments of that. There are women to this day, 2023, that are walking to rivers somewhere in the world and hope the alligator don't get them before they get the water back to the village. So there are things that are happening that we're just not connected to. So that's what I try to do is connect people to what are what is real. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be big and organic and authentic. Mothers are real. You want to know anything, ask the, ask the mother. Mm -hmm. Because some mother, we have the most expansive human experience and it's our job to be culture bearers. We pass on that information to the children of who right, you are right. and where you come from. If that ritualistic, if that cultural things, if that generation has not been destroyed or been dismantled based on, you know, the dominant culture or the power, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are the things I have people look at. What are other hidden things that are barriers to us to be fully human beings? So those are the, that's the kind that's the challenge. And just to hear a mother say, I don't have time for two hours for myself, mm -hmm. is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have babysitters in 2023 because you can't afford them or you don't have the connections with your family or the village or your community. A lot of people in their communities don't know their neighbors. Mm -hmm. I grew up where you could ask a neighbor to watch a child for two hours. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about you owe me $40. Or I want a cup of sugar. Or I'm just, hey, we're, we're a little short today. What can you help me with? And you come over here and we got some extra plates of food. We don't have that anymore. And that's what kept people yeah. in community. But it was mothers. Mm -hmm. So this mutual mm -hmm. aid stuff is not new. Mm -hmm. this, you know, the social gospel isn't new. Social justice isn't new. Women have been doing this for years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the church is actually run by the women. 
mm-hmm. poorest of women. Mm-hmm. They're doing that tithing. So we have to look at where does our economy go and how do we value that? We've got to value women. So the hardest thing is constantly saying, value women, value women, value women. That's mm-hmm. the hardest mm-hmm. thing for me. Value the mothers. That's been very hard. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I know a couple um, women filmmakers who have talked about how difficult it is um, like pursuing filmmaking after they've mm-hmm. given birth to a child and like mm-hmm. having to balance both you know being a mother and being an artist and so I definitely like like understand and see very clearly like mm-hmm. the issues that we have going on but what about you two like what are the things that have been challenging but also affirming I mean growing up you know I wouldn't be an artist without the generations of Dakota women because mm-hmm. in our culture the men you know they achieved things in society by their war accomplishments and a, a woman in our society actually, you know, achieved higher status by the art that she creates because everything that she created for her family, you know, she put her art, her love and everything into the beautiful design she was creating for them, um, the way she decorated the teepee. Because in our culture, the women, they owned all the material, they owned the house, um, you know, they were in charge of taking care of the children and they, grouped together you know the grandmothers they would sort of babysit the children be their teachers during the day while the women performed their tasks or worked on their clothing Um, and so it's just like you were talking about the generation of um, generational knowledge is passed down through women and like if it wasn't for my ancestors my mom my aunts my grandmothers you know I wouldn't be a Dakota person I wouldn't be a Dakota artist I wouldn't have this power you know that comes from women and so um, you know growing up I always always saw my mom making big work making this beautiful art you know for us um, but also using that art to be able to sell it and like support us as a family Um, and she's always um, you know so willing to take care of any child that she saw they needed help like my cousins or anyone you know she doesn't matter if it was a child um, you know she always had love towards them and so growing up um, you know, that's why I want to create educational material or um, opportunities for younger people to see our culture as the strength of power. And even when I create public art that's teaching about the land to us, you know, the earth is Unchi Maka, Grandmother Earth, you know. And for me, it's so easy to honor your grandmother, but you would think society could understand that concept in a way where they're not polluting the water, polluting the air, you know, Mm -hmm. destroying the soil. Like if you saw the earth as your grandmother, you wouldn't do the things Mm -hmm. that are done, you know? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I guess some of that challenge I've had, you know, as an artist is sort of um, teaching um, from the land. You know, I get a lot of support, but every now and then, you know, I'll get, uh, people who don't like this for some reason or another, like, I was creating a mural in Bloomington and I created a very geometric design and in the middle had this, this two inverted triangles. We call that kapemini, which is mirroring. So we believe what happens above is reflected below. We believe that the Milky Way is the spirit road that we travel in the afterworld and that's reflected on Earth as the Mississippi River. And so we want to honor our ancestors and be close to them and so that's why a lot of burial mounds are along the Mississippi River Mm -hmm. and so that illustration is just sort of teaching why um, we build burial mounds where they are why it has that connection to the river and then we know when we say we come from the stars and we return to the stars that the teaching is all within that Kapemini symbol and you know I thought this was very straightforward design um, that's just teaching about our culture but I didn't realize that the funder of the festival was actually the construction company that removed burial mounds in Bloomington when they put in the new light rail Mm -hmm. stations Mm -hmm. and a few new buildings. There was actually burial mound stairs and it happened in the early 2000s. There was protests, all this and that. And they showed up to the meeting with a bunch of documents that showed why they had permission to remove the burial mounds. And, you know, I wasn't there to like start a fight or bring up whatever these people are feeling. But I'm like, well, if you have all this guilt, obviously, that you still Mm -hmm. have about what you did, why don't you, as a land developer, um, you know, try to make amends somehow, you know, perhaps create a park that is like a memorial to this burial mounds and maybe, because burial mounds were not 
a single person's act. It's a community art project mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. sense, you would say. It's a community activity that honored our ancestors. So why can't we do another community mm -hmm. um, activity to honor that history, you know? Like, why do you come here with documents? Why are you here for a fight, um, you know, versus, like I said, we have a past. We're currently in the present, and we're all creating that future. So we can create a future where you don't show up defensive to meetings. Um, and so, you know, I've worked with other people who are land developers who put the Dakota land map in every single one of their buildings. They um, bring in the Dakota language teacher to do a video talking about how this is our land. And so, you know, there's good developers, I feel like, who are trying to honor the land. Like, everybody needs a place to live. And so they build the buildings so we can live in. Um, but they also want to recognize that the land that they're disturbing you know, it has a history that belongs to Dakota people. And so they work to honor us. And then you get these other places that, you know, want to start a fight. They want to, I don't know, why do you show up with all these documents when mm -hmm. I'm just here to create art that mm -hmm. teaches about the history that was here a lot longer than your construction company existed. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, so my mother, my aunt, my grandmothers, but also Grandmother Earth, all of these women, you know, give me power to create as a Dakota person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I remember reading on your website um, that like specifically the way you frame your work is like bringing modernity to um, Dakota culture. And I think that's like, was very much present what you just mentioned, you know, like how do we honor the past, but also like find ways to um, still create for the present and move forward in the future. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just like want to uh, like echo something that both of you have said too, and it's I think it's like really important too, right? Like in the art world, um, especially in the art world, um, like women artists are uh, like you know they they are looked down upon, and especially when you become a mother, right? The question is always, can you still have a practice, like and be a mother, right? And that's always the challenge, and I think. For so long, um, uh, men especially have like, like always questioned women artists, right? And so, you know, I know that I, you know I don't have any, um, you know, I don't have any children of my own. But I remember when I had, um, uh, uh, when I started watching a niece and a nephew, uh, that question came up: like, how are you going to be an artist now? right, that you are now watching these kids and these kids are taking up your time and so like time that you could be uh, using towards making art, like how are you, like how do you then decide uh, like, you know, when do you make art and when you watch your kids and I think like that is always a struggle, you know. Um, so being a woman in the art world, I feel like that is always like a struggle. Um, and then also like be a woman, being a woman of color in the art world that mm -hmm. is predominantly filled with, um, you know, uh, cis white men and, you know, white people and institutions that are, uh, you know, uh, th that have mostly large white patrons, right? And so, like, mm -hmm. I feel like that is always a challenge. Um, and especially from somebody who is refusing to uh, make work that uh, uh, outside of the, my community, right? And so like the work that I make is predominantly about my community. Um, and I say that it's for my community, right? Um, but also like where I show that is also, can be problematic too in that like, you know, in places that I've shown this work has been predominantly white institutions, right? Um, and so, yeah, I feel like, yeah, there's like a lot of these like uh, struggles and um, things that happen, but also like, things that are reaffirming too is that like you know i um like i know that uh like the work that i'm making is the work that i should be making um is the work that i want to make you know um and that like there's something important about the work that i'm making even if it's just for me it is very mm -hmm. important um and so that becomes really reaffirming for me you know but I think like there is a lot of the struggle and I think that's a struggle. A lot of it is that like, I'm a woman artist, I'm a woman of color, and I like the work and the industry that we are in is predominantly filled with uh, white folks, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, I um, I really resonate with both of you saying. Uh, my first museum experience as an artist was the was Wiseman Art Museum, and they asked me to do an installation for uh, Black History Month and for Women's History Month, uh, the 2020. Of course, we have no idea what goes on in a museum. Absolutely. I did a mocking. I just, whoa, I can have a museum and I can do whatever? You're giving me a room? Oh, yeah, this is yeah. great. I invited 133 artists and asked them, okay, how, when, when can we be here? What can we do? Whatever. Oh, you can do whatever you want. Within two weeks, they were saying, we can't do this. Yeah. I mean, I had artists, puppets. I had people swinging from the, chan you know, the chandelier. Um, art on the walls, people in the elevators. I, had a, I have a large sized doll of myself that people were terrified of. Mm -hmm. and she was just sitting in a rocker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was interesting. And what I was told when I was kind of pulled aside and said, you've got to scale this down, because I had something going from Tuesday to Sunday. Mm -hmm. We had acts, we had plays, we had everything. And I also believed I don't ever do anything without a community. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and where, if it's a new space, I'm, in, I'm coming with somebody. I'm not coming alone. Uh, I was literally told it had to be scaled down. I was wearing out the staff, and they weren't used to having this kind of activity. I said, but you invited me. Mm -hmm. You invited Amake Kubat. If anybody knows Amake Kubat, it's going to go south. Mm. I can't help myself. I'm very much like Forrest Gump. It just, <laughs> something happens, and I don't know how it happened, but it did. And you're going to have to trust me for that. I, I'm not going to bring any harm to your thing, but they said, we're used to having dead men, dead white men on the walls. And I said, I don't think I'm dead or white or male, mm. so that's on you. But this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what we ended up doing. And it ended up being one of the things. They had never had anything like it before. Mm -hmm. I said, you, how do you expect me as a person of color, my age, who I am, to come in here and paint the Mona Lisa and throw it up on the wall? Mm -hmm. You know, and I pointed out to him. I said, well, that's really great. I said, and, and I'm not going to have you have my art that it's folky and it's, you know, primitive and blah, 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 blah. I said, because look at the MFA people that are now doing art. Uh, who, who was he? Uh, da Vinci didn't get an MFA. Picasso didn't get an MFA. And they painted things that people have yet to be able to figure out how they painted it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, I see people get M MFAs and they're, 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 they're nailing Kotex to the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? You <laughs> did all that to do that? And what's your, what, what is your statement? I mean, it's like, I don't get it. So I told him, you can't, I'm going to always be feral. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to try to duplicate what's already there that's not working for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the conversation I bring. I tell people, mm -hmm. if you want me to come, get ready to change. Mm -hmm. You're going to change me too, but you're going to probably be the, the most out of your comfort zone on that. So mm -hmm. bringing artists with me and grooming artists with me, and especially mothers and women, you yeah, know, we, yeah. we've got to come. We did an ancestral doll making contest, I mean, a, a, a workshop, and it was supposed to be for 20 people. We had, it was, we could have filled up this paper and they kept coming. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They were white. Mm. We kept saying, there must be something, and they were crying as they made their doll. They were like, mm. yeah, so I said, this is the energy we need to exchange. This is mm -hmm. the opportunity for us to heal. This is the opportunity for us to, for to be together through our thinking. Mm. Um, so that, that's what I, what I attempt to bring, is to bring the healing and bring in um, how to look at how to repair harm. Uh, there's two steps. Don't come in with... I'm going to help you, don't come in, I'm going to fix it. Come in that there's something that's been harmed or destroyed, and how are we going to address that? What do people want so they feel like they're heard and it's been addressed? And let's, how do we dismantle this system that it happened so it doesn't happen again? Mm -hmm. That's repair. That's rep reparation for me. Mm -hmm. So those are the things I bring uh, to Martin A in these, these institutions that I'm always, it's always amazing to me that I get invited to places and then I have to fight about who I am. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I'm, I think I'm the clearest person on the planet right now about who I am. Because mm -hmm. I will take my marbles in a minute and go home. Yep, yep mm -hmm. got it. I'm out of here. Two says, <laughs> going to go listen to Kendrick Lamar for the hundredth time. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, so that's that. Yeah, so I, but yeah, coming into places and you're expected to be something yeah. different. Mm -hmm. And where we, we are seen is very important to me. Yeah. I mean, I think that that has a lot to do. I mean, I think that, like, you know, like the museums historically has always been these white spaces, right? And 
you know, like, I mean, like, literally, too, right? And, like, figuratively. And I think, you know, I think just very recently, you know, I mean, like, I think museums are starting to realize, too, that, like, you know, um, that these spaces are no longer, you know, white, mm -hmm. and that, um, and, and, and that they're, that, that that they can be different, and you know, I, I you know, I, I think it's wonderful, right, that you went into the space and that you like did not back down on what you wanted to do at all, right? Yeah. That's because I think a lot of us, like even like I think about myself sometimes, and uh, when I've been invited into spaces, and I think about like what I want to do and what I want to do and what actually happens are like always two different things. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like building that courage and having courage to say, actually, I want to do this, and if I don't get to do this, then like maybe I don't want to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. You know, is something that I feel like as a young artist, I'm always like working towards, like mm -hmm. you know, making sure that like um, what I want to do and my voice is heard. You know, yeah. so mm -hmm. I think that that's wonderful that right. that, you, that you continue to do that, and that we are then able to like see you do this, and then. Also, like, you know, like, be inspired by it, too, you know? Well, you know, you're, you call yourself a young artist. I call myself a young artist, too, because I taught till I was, you know, 63. Of course. And I didn't start doing art until I was 65. So of course. I feel like I can't say I'm an emerging artist because <laughs> I've been around a long time, mm -hmm. but I don't have the skills. I didn't have the skills. I didn't have the community. I didn't have the knowledge. I, didn't have the, I had to learn the language all the time. Of course. Like, I don't even know what you just said. Of course. But I'm okay with that. I'm, you know, hey. If you want me to be here, you need to talk to me in a way that I can understand what you're saying. But we, we're spending much time just spinning new words so we can sound good. Of but course. I, you know, I can go home. I don't, I don't, you know, I can listen to AM and FM yeah. radio at home. I don't have to hear this mess here. So I think it's a matter of learning that maturity and, and knowing when, where you get where you are. But yeah, I'm, I'm real interested. I, well, it's not even my conversation. No, no, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Don't. <laughs> no, it was worry. just something that was said that I was like, I don't get a chance to see artists. And that's, it. that's a hard thing. I'm isolated a lot. Mm -hmm. So I don't get a chance to see that. Also, the difficulty is I now have a disability where mobility is a really hard job. And a lot of the institutions, uh, museums and theaters, they're outdated, so they're renovating, but they're not putting elevators in. Mm. They're not putting hand lifts in, you know, rails, uh, ramps. Uh, so having to go to the walker after it's been remodeled three times since I've been here, mm -hmm. and I still have to go around and find the freight elevator to get to the stage to see something. I don't go anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't go. Um, did a performance in August. They had to build handrails for me to get up on the stage. I can't. I just can't leap up on that yeah, table yeah. like that anymore. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of that when I was young, but it's not happening now. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning. It's it's still pioneering for me because I'm in a different body doing with different abilities mm -hmm. than I was, you know, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that I'm trying to tell younger people: take care of the knees, take care of that back. You know, don't be so reckless. Uh, but again look at the ways that you can also um, impact wherever you were that it you left it better than they could possibly ever do. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. I know I did what you asked me to do, but I also gave you the gift of some insight or some, some knowledge or something else from me. I am a gift to you, and that's how I see myself mm -hmm. with any human being. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I don't have to talk to anybody. I'm a person that can hang up, put the phone down, and don't know where it is for weeks. <laughs> so, but because I remember not having a cell phone. I didn't have mm. one until I was 60. Mm. It still can't work one. I found a flashlight on one the other day, and was like, I don't know how to turn off. When does the, light the phone have a flashlight? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know how to turn, so my purse was lit up until somebody came home. Technology has gone but a long way. But it wasn't way. important to me. What's important to me is connecting to people, yeah, and what's yeah. important to me is making a difference in the world, and sometimes those differences. But I think artists, uh, we are leading the charge. Mm -hmm. We are leading the charge. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, because I was actually going to, we've been floating around this question, but I wanted to like ask, like, how have your identities affected the way you make art, and you perceive art, and you take in art, right? Because identity, not just in like being a woman, but you know, being first gen, being disabled, being of said cultural heritage, right? Like, how have those different identities, those intersecting identities, affected the way you approach and create art? Yeah, I mean, I think like for me, right? Like, um, the thing that I absolutely hate and like am always like trying to like 
uh, work with and work around and like maybe even at some point like embrace. You know, I think like being an artist, being among artists, being a first generation among artists, being um, like an artist of color, being, you know, like, I think that oftentimes like I get pigeonholed into these like, like compartments mm -hmm. and like a part of me is like, yes, I am all these things and um, I love these things. And then a part of me is also, yes, I am all these things, but I am so much more than all right. these things mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's like a double-edged sword sometimes, you know, like um, if a curator is organizing, curating a Hmong, you know, uh, like art-based project, I'm probably gonna get called. And I get to decide, you know, like, you know, is this what I want? Do I want this? Do I want to just like be asked to be in these shows because of like the themes? Or like, am I like, am I an artist that's like all these things, but also like large enough so that I can also like show next to like my white counterparts, my white mm -hmm. artist counterparts, like, you know, like, and it's always this sort of back and forth, you know? Yeah. I don't know, like I think that's something that I'm still like mm -hmm. trying to like work around, you mm -hmm. know, or work with or be okay with, I don't know. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, I guess for me, um, I'm okay with being a Dakota artist, I'm okay with people thinking about that because I don't think people think about Native people enough. Um, mm. So if I could show up and take up space and be visible, then you know I will be that person. Um, but I also know that that's a place of power to be and it's these institutions for me to be there. Sometimes it's a privilege that I'm there to um, put up with the things that have happened and also do it in a somewhat positive way. I don't like that word positive, but you know, just being honest and truthful without um, judgmental or holding ourselves back because I do want to go forward as a, you know, as a person or as a community. And so like I worked with the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum to create a new augmented reality public walk and it's called the um, Dakota Sacred Hoop Walk and I told them you know a lot of Native people don't go to your place because it's expensive and you know and if they brought their whole family I don't think they could afford it I think they need groceries more than they need to see art um, that's just how it is and so I told them you know if you want me there uh, you should make this free for indigenous people to attend because there's other museums like the Bale Museum or the Science Museum they've already done that you know and they didn't need a native person to sort of really push it you know they knew they knew it needed to happen if you're going to do a land acknowledgement do some more action besides just read that yeah. speech you know and so part of the process was creating so now it's free for indigenous people to go to the landscape arboretum you know um, and I get like the Walker Art Center they email me every year and I told them you know I'm pretty offended by the fact that you wanted to build that scaffold that mm -hmm. represented you know the worst thing that ever happened to my people you did it without any community input um, you're gonna put it next to a little mini golf course people could play and take selfies on it like I have no idea where you thought that was like mm -hmm. an appropriate thing to mm -hmm. do and so I'm still pretty offended I'll probably be a friend offended the rest of my life and I've never honestly been offended by art you know, I always saw art was like a positive place, um, you know, and so for them to like create an artwork or to pay for an artwork that, you know, hurt my community so much, like you're going to have to do a lot more than just say, you know, can we just pay you money and you can do an event here? Like, yeah, so whenever they email me, I, I always tell them, A, I'm not going to do it, but you should also make this free for Native people every single day, not just your free Thursday night or whatever that day is you know and mm -hmm. maybe even yeah. go further like why isn't this more accessible for people like you mentioned um you know like physical disabilities or physical limits like it's not just that too but like i go to an art museum and it's all white people visitors you know it's mm -hmm. even if they have people of color on the wall i don't see those communities feeling like this is a space for them so mm -hmm. you're gonna have to like sort of rebrand and rethink how you connect with people you know and if you want to bring in someone like me to bring open a door for my community to come in 
you know, then do it in a way that you want to support that mission. You know, that you're going to have continued native programming. You can connect with more native people. It's not just me. You're going to let, let the youth come in here and do activities and I feel like this is a place that maybe they could have a career here. Maybe that they can bring their kids here, you know, that the way we go to parks, you know, we always feel like nature is a place that is safe and accessible and accepting of all people. And art museums, they should have that same mentality. And, you know, some are doing good work to change, and others are sort of, I don't know, still stuck in the past. So, mm -hmm. you know, I use my, who I am, like how you're talking about, like if they don't do it, then I'll just take my marbles and go home. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be there. I have mm -hmm. a lot of other people sending me emails. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I just let them know, like if you want me there and you want our, my community to come there, then I want to make sure that you're not just wasting their time, that this is not just a one-off thing, that this is something you're dedicated to honoring. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do a land acknowledgement, you have sort of evoked the power of the land of Native people, and you shouldn't just use our names in vain or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. be dedicated to that. Like an artist is dedicated to finishing the canvas, might take a hundred hours, might take a thousand hours, might take their whole lives, but artists know that dedication, you know, the way a mother knows the dedication of raising her child every day. That effort you put into the child makes a difference in the community, and that's how mm -hmm. they should see their building or the institution, you know, as an investment that pays off over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's just talking about like how your identities have impacted the way you approach art. But you did speak a little bit. Too. A little bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think what is interesting for me is um, I've never really been attached to any particular place. Mm -hmm. So my my um, identity is more like a, a, a traveler, oh. uh, a, a very a person that more of a. I've always wanted to be a citizen of the world because I didn't have a place. I didn't have a family. Um, I went back to California where I was born a month ago and realized this is no longer my home, <laughs> but neither is Minnesota, mm -hmm. but I've been here 40 years, mm -hmm. but there's places I feel like I belong. Like I, there's a place in um, North Minneapolis that has a boat launch. Mm -hmm. I love going down to the boat launch. Mm -hmm. um, it became really a, a very, very popular during the pandemic. So I stopped going there because I, it was like, people, I don't know if people were living there, but it was like always cars morning, noon, and night. So I figured, mm. uh, I told f some people about the spot and we would go and pray or we would give offerings and that type of thing. Then all of a sudden there's just always people there taking pictures and graduations and whatever. I'm thinking, okay, that's not my spot anymore. <laughs> so looking, looking for your spots. But I think my identity is wrapped up. I've been looking, um, I'm 72. And I have been thinking most of my life, I was happier when I was in dirt and water. Hmm. Uh, my grandmother was of some mixed ancestry. We, I have, I know she wasn't black. And at one point, I was screamed at because uh, I loved going over her house, and they said they let me. They, she let me run wild because she was Indian. So I don't know what my grandmother was, although she told me different ways. She talked about the Trail of Tears. I was surprised to hear you say that. And I was like, I would like to know what she knew about that. But she talked about it, and I was like, I didn't understand it. She was born in 1889. So she was 65 when I was born, so everything was old to me, whatever she said. Mm -hmm. um, but looking at the ways that she lived, she believed in listening to dreams. So I've learned to be a dreamer. I, I can get up and walk around the house and go back to sleep and go right back into the same dream. I can come out of a dream and have some of that dream world with me. Um, her thing was also watching animals and watching the sky. So I love watching the sky. I love, I love watching animals. I love the change of scenery. I think Minnesota has taught me a lot about looking at, I think the first world is the natural world. Mm -hmm and we have messed up as human beings. We didn't fell off some kind of way. And so my thing is looking at how did we fall off and how do you get back on and how do you reconnect? For me, that's water, that's air, that's land, that's living things. Um, but I didn't hear those stories when we were going through craziness here in the Twin Cities. I got a lot of calls from people that were freaked out because of the changes and I would try to say, you can't make an egg without an omelet without breaking an egg. Right. That's where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to get to an omelet, but we're breaking eggs. Mm -hmm. So eggs are your seeds, and eggs are what if you do something. So let's look about how do we get to that. A lot of angst with white males that 
oh, you know, the structure was gone. Like, well, I can't go to work, and this is my, this is my little spot over here, and let whoever at home take care of everything else. I mean, I literally, if I could have started a, 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 a therapy practice, I would have, I'd have made money because it was suddenly like people were freaking out out of coming out of this norm. So my identity has always been I'm good at changing. I've never had a problem with changing. I tra moved around a lot, uh, trained, lived in seven countries, uh, married, a, married a man who was from the Czechoslovakia at the time I married him. Never heard. I told him it was a lie. It was no place that you couldn't come from a place that started with CZ. <laughs> <laughs> so how ignorant I was as an American, not knowing <laughs> geography. And he spoke 10 languages. And he was very odd to me after a while, and I couldn't figure it out. And now, 20 something years later, he was as autistic as they could possibly have come and no one knew anything about it in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So living with him was li like living in a blender. Mm -hmm. You never know what was whipping up and when, to, please hurry up and turn the button off so I can come, out, come up out of this jar and then you'd be back in it. And I've learned so much about people by having somebody in my life that was outside of that, outside of what my norm was. Mm -hmm. He was outside of my norm. Uh, coming out of the 60s, I had never been around white people. So now here I'm in Europe, just because they're English and they speak English does not mean that they speak English in a way that I understood it. So I was black with, with Ebonics and King's English in Liverpool with another accident with the Czech man. Mm. So it was, it was so, uh, I am the, my identity has been forged by my curiosity mm. of how I'm mm. curious about the world and how I'm willing to take the risk and put my ego down and say, I gotta know about that. Oh, wait a minute. You know, I've had people tell me, yes, we told you that, you know, you've said you're tired, you're not gonna ever work with these people, you're not gonna do this, this, and the other. And they'll go, yeah, you told us that, but what would you do with a boat? And I'm like, you're gonna let me have a boat? <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm gonna show up and clown. And I did. We took 100 people down the Mississippi on the, in the uh, St. Paul side, and we had African music, storytellers, the kids were throwing offerings of seeds and fruit in, 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 into the river. Uh, we had people playing banjos. Uh, we had an African historian who played, did the blues and the stories about black people on the Mississippi and, and the way station that it was. I made these people stop at the, at, there's a place in the river where there was something with the Dakota women, the uh, 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 peoples, and we honored. I said, I have, to, I have to leave an offering here. I just can't just go buy it. Like, woo, that was cute. No, <laughs> no, no, I got, to, I got to honor this energy. So when we got to, um, toward twilight when it was getting to get dark and we had said our prayers and promised what we would do with the rivers and the earth. I had everybody sign a thing, environmentally, we're gonna do this. We're gonna take better care of the river. We're gonna learn da 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 da, -da and had them sign it. And we ripped them up and threw them over the boat. And the last offering was this watermelon. Um, and I said, okay, I gotta do this so I can get the paddles. Miss the paddles, and then when he big kaplunk of this big watermelon, and then there was this hush. And after this hush, you could see where it was going from day to night. All of a sudden, these eagles turned up and they followed the boat. And we counted 11 of them. Wow. People were crying and screaming, and one person went into a trance, and it was like, grab that one, she's gonna go off the end of the boat. I mean, it was, it was uh, all of a sudden, it was 100 vo voices singing, Wade in the Water. I mean, we wept. Group 100 yeah. people that had never been together before were just boohooing. And I thought, okay, that was that I did not know when you say you're going to do something and you don't know how it's going to start. I say, have your intent of what you want to do, but there's always an element of spirit mm -hmm. where it's going to go another direction. Absolutely. And, and put your ego down. Not, I'm not talking to you personally, but set my ego down Absolutely. and let it happen. Of course. And that's when I think art happens because heart is there. So Absolutely. I call myself a heartist. I can't go through this multicultural blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I can't do all that, I can't remember it. So, so I'm a heartist, I do art. Far as my practice is whatever I have to practice with. Mm -hmm. So I'm now, I'm now in love with making sticks in a bundle. Tie up sticks together and they're unbreakable. You put sticks together, you can't break them. They're one stick you could break. Now you put them in bundles. I've had just had kids doing that, and they have these great stories. Our sticks in the bundle now are like 
They got clothes, they got eyeballs, they got, I mean, and, and they got raffia, and they got bells, and, and, but it's the thing of how you get people to talk about their family. Where this stick is dad, this stick is uncle, this stick is da-da-da, this stick mm -hmm. is the woman, and you bind them together with something pretty or rubber band or whatever they do. So my art evolves around kind of what's available, mm -hmm. um, and my, I think my, my, I think as 72 year old, I still play like a toddler. Mm. I love to play. I love to laugh. I love to have music. I love asking people what are their processes and how do you do stuff. But I don't have a genre because I wasn't trained to do any of it. Mm. I just love mm. doing it. Mm. And I have to thank a teacher who knew that I could not, I stuttered, so I couldn't get anything right. So she made me write what I wanted to say, but I could read it. Mm -hmm. So she, she got me into being a little bit more correct. She put me in chorus, even though I can't hold a note, and fought for it. So she taught me how to fight for people that, you know, I'm going to put her in chorus so she can learn the chorus, so she can learn the vocabulary. What an ingenious idea. You know, I'm going to make sure she does this over here so she's part of the group. She's, mm -hmm. her, her strength mm -hmm. is she writes, but she's going to hold the paper like that and read it, but at least her voice is heard because I, right. I, 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 I was just stuttering. So mm -hmm. I, I looked at the teachers that were, I think, more like parents to me, and how they shaped me also as an artist. They let me draw things. I had a, a history teacher that said, okay, here's your history test for the, year, for the end of the, um, your final grade, and it was a blank piece of paper. And I was like, what kind of test is this? And she said, I want you to tell me something you learned in a way that I know you learned it. And I made my paper a newspaper, and I told her about World War II and my connection of what I thought my connection was to Jewish people with that. And, sh and it was like, she said no student had ever done that. I said, but that was the only way I could tell you the story. Mm -hmm. So that learned, taught me I was a storyteller. So it's been a lot of different things to shape who I've become, and I'm still becoming. I tell people, it's not over when you get 62 and retire. I, I, I feel like Star Trek. I'm, gonna, I'm going to different planets every dang day. Mm -hmm. And learning about the Tribbles and the Vulcans and everybody else, and that, but I'm also learning about myself. So yeah. when you talk about forging identity, I don't mm -hmm. think it stops. I think we keep growing. Yeah. Oh, for sure, for sure. So a lot of you guys touched on like um, at the beginning how you know trying to make art and trying to take up space, but also not like becoming a type of token, right? Because mm -hmm. the space is so white, and it's like once you enter it, you almost become a token for them, and how it's so difficult manage like navigating um, that role and like, okay, I'm an artist and I'm doing like cultural stuff, but I don't want to be tokenized. And then having like amazing folks like teachers around you who are like helping you and supporting you and creating that path for you. And so I guess the question I wanna pose is like, um, with all the wisdom that you guys have, like how can we as a community here in Minnesota, as a community here in St. Paul, Minneapolis, like how can we foster a space where young girls, young women, and older women like can thrive as artists? This is a good example. Mm. Oh. This is a good example when you invite other people that are not your community or, you, or your age set or whatever, that this is how you do it. You invite mm -hmm. people into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's like the best answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think giving kids the opportunity of being in places they might never have thought was possible. Like I see young women behind the camera right now, you know, like whoever thought growing up, you know, I could be the one filming movies, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I could be the one being that cinematographer creating the environment, you know, capturing these moments, um, playing that important part, you know, of making sure that things are happening. Like, so I just think you know, like growing up, I never knew that, I never thought, you know, that I could be a professional artist and sort of work in the community and be able to listen to like what people want and how I can help them through artwork and knowing that art can have that power in so many different ways that it's not just a picture on the wall, you know? Um, and so I guess for me, it was hard for me to, cause I grew up, I was like introverted. I never really liked to talk. Like I always had straight A's, I was a great writer, but um, you know, I just didn't really have an uh, interest in really connecting with people until I learned that, um, you know, I could serve people. I can, like, serve the community with the talents I have and sort of elevate and open doors or change things so that, um, you know, that Native people are being seen or heard or 
um, seen in a modern way too um, because I also thought, you know, my great great grandmother, she was one of the first Native women to sign like this pledge of American citizenship because she wanted to move forward. She wanted to have citizenship. She owned 3,000 acres of land. She wanted to make sure that that's her property. It's not her husband or it's not mm -hmm. someone else's, mm -hmm. you know, that she had the legal right. She could go to court for herself. She could vote, um, you know. So she wasn't dreaming of living in the time before her, you know. She was living a time she lived in. And so, you know, I just think letting women and mothers you know, know that you have that, you know, the gift of life and it should be honored, but you should also have opportunities to become a senator, to become a doctor, a teacher, um, you know, working in audio, video, um, all of these things. I just feel like letting women know that anything they want to do, they can do, you know, that you shouldn't be restricted and that there could be internships, there can be um, you know, people coming to classrooms and saying, you know, this is how I got into doing this job. You know, I wasn't given opportunities, you know, maybe a couple little doors opened up. I made the most of it and letting kids know that, you know, no matter your background, you really can achieve a lot in your life. So, mm -hmm. and like you said to you, the age doesn't matter. Like you don't have a cutoff date when you need to achieve mm -hmm. things. You know, I think a lot of younger people, they think, oh, I don't graduate college yet, or I didn't even go to college yet. And the rest of my life is like scrapped. I'm like, you're going to live for a long time, and you can literally reinvent yourself at mm -hmm. any point, you know. Mm -hmm. So don't forget that either. Definitely. Yeah, so I think that <clears throat> I think that a lot of it is, like, accessibility, right? Like, having access to spaces that historically, like, folks don't have access to, right? Especially, like, communities of color. So I think that that's really important. You know, um, I teach at the University of Minnesota, and um, I teach an intro class, and the students coming into my intro class are um, often not all white students, right? They are Hmong students, they're um, African American, they're Somalis, they're Natives, they, you know, they're from different parts of the world, and, um, you know, I think that historically, you know, when I was going, to, when I was, in undergrad, um, like the artists that were shown to me, right, in these intro classes were largely white artists, like these canons, right? And so uh, it was really hard to like to see myself in, as a photographer, to see myself as an artist. And I think like that is really important as a as a teacher too to say, you know what, like let me look at my students, my demographic, the student demographic. And let me show work from artists that look like them, who are making work like them, you know. And I think like when you do that, that always like there's always that spark of interest that uh, mm. that, that 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 happens with students. And so, I I I I'm I am always trying um, to uh, be very like cognizant of that. And like um, as an educator, that is what I do. Like. Um, and that's what I do purposely, right? Um, I think too that like, right, like what are the ways in which we can, um, you know, encourage uh, uh, girls and uh, teenagers um, to like be artists and, you know, and I think like it's like, yeah, it's like showing us, right? It's talking about, um, it's, it's us talking about the practice. It's us, it's them seeing us and them realizing that like, if we can do them, if we can do it, if we we have all we have f familiar backgrounds, and like if we can do it, they can also do it, right? And that like it doesn't matter at what age, right? You can be 62 and have a like start a career, right? Or you, you can come from a family or you know um, a, a a a family of makers and and, and still be a maker. Or that, like you know, some uh, you know, a, 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 a refugee girl from Laos can like grow up and can be an artist. Like you know, so like I think like those are really really important, yeah. right? Yeah. To like uh, to encourage uh, mm -hmm. uh, younger folks to mm -hmm. you know be in the arts or you know to study the arts or mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of the first examples of Hong American artists that I saw was actually you and mm. um, Kali Yang, who is a digital illustrator and stuff. So 
I think that was a very important factor for me, like coming all this way to like become an artist myself. So I think what you guys have said about like you know just showing that there are folks like you who are out there making art itself, like that very simple example is so important, mm. and it means so much to younger girls who are aspiring to be artists. Mm. Um, so you guys have been artists for a while now, right? So I think um, what are some future plans, future projects, and where do you see yourself five years from now mm. or ten years from now even? Mm. Huh. Wow. <laughs> 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 well, I'm excited to say I've had an idea of, um, like I say, as, as an elder person, I like to keep myself busy and I like being playful and happy. So after a few years of bouncing around this idea that people didn't understand, I'm going to be um, piloting three new Yo Mama's Houses programs. One of them is the Hush Your Mouth Social Club, which is a drop-in art making space that I'll have at the Lopit Foundation in North Minneapolis, mm -hmm. Australia. The second one is uh, the Elder Daytime Disco. So mm. it is a nightclub that's in the daytime for <laughs> older people. Oh, so okay, the older okay. woman and her guest can come <laughs> in and we're gonna do dances from the 60s to the mm -hmm. 90s. We're going to have old school music, and we're going to have good food and non-alcoholic drinks. If they got the little flask in their purse, <laughs> that's their business. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I want to see um, bodies moving mm -hmm. and people building social networks and having a good time and be safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I don't go out to nightclubs anymore. There's just too much stuff going on. Um, uh, I love music. I love you know live bands. I love all of that. So I thought, give it to myself. Mm. So we're gonna figure out how to have the live bands mm. or really good Spotify. I guess that's what you use. I'm not quite <laughs> sure how that works, but have good music. I've got a playlist going on for someone to do. Uh, someone who can get up and do the dances. I'm barely doing the Soul Train line now. I'm gonna try to figure out how to do it with my walker but I'm gonna keep doing it. So just all the things that bring us joy in the body. And, and dancing and music has been a way for uh, black people to get together intergenerational. Everybody gets out on the dance floor and does a wobble. They may not know their left and their right, mm -hmm. but they get out there on the floor <laughs> and they do what they can do. So in the spirit of that, and then the last one is in the spirit of our mothers. Because I haven't had a mother, and, and holidays have always been hard for me, one of the things I started doing about 10 years ago was having a dinner uh, around Mother's Day for women who did not have mothers or mm -hmm. had a strange relationship with mothers so we can come and grieve or talk mm -hmm. about it. But I would also just pamper and love them up and send them back out again for another year. So that was actually asked of me to do and to mm -hmm. bring back. So that will be happening this year. So May will be a very busy year for me to do that. Uh, I'm partnering with Mudluck, which is Sage Carroll's um, clay studio in, in, Nor in um, South Minneapolis, and we'll be having some drop-in art programs there so people can come. I'm going to try not to have people in my house. Someone came to my house and gave me COVID, so okay. I, don't, I don't need to be sick anymore. So we're going to try to find spaces where we can socially distance mm -hmm. and we can be together that way. So I'm looking forward to us programming again. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We've been doing really minimum things, and I've been doing one-on-ones a lot uh, for the last three years plus doing my own work. Mm -hmm. um, I do have an installation at the M at this time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd love you to go, I don't know how you see it, but I think you have to go outside and look out the window and look inside of it. You'll oh. see the big doll, oh. but you'll see one of my um, uh, a 10 foot tapestry that I did like in four hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the week. I mean, I, I'm fast. I'm like driving a car. I'm <laughs> going. And then I have a sticks in a bundle that's nine feet. Oh. So I had a really good time with that one. It has lights, it has everything. So that's something new, and that was something that someone invited me to do So uh, 2025. We're in conversation of bringing Amocalypse, which mm. will be a sh total show by myself. Oh. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's so that's so what I'm exciting. looking forward to, yes. It's a lot, but it's very exciting. It's a lot, yes, <laughs> yes, but I love it, I love it. Mm. And you too? Um, I guess for me, w when I created the Dakota Spirit Walk, which is like the GPS augmented reality in St. Paul, um, th you walk through it, you know, I really enjoyed bringing people out to a space, out to the land, um, letting the land be a teacher again and using technology um, and sort of changing people's perspective on technology. A lot of people think, oh, put down your phone and go outside and play, you know, they act like they're two different things. but 
you know, I let people use their phone to sort of immerse themselves into mm -hmm. these, uh, the natural world around them so that they learn these stories, they can connect to it better. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are divorced from nature. They don't have a real kinship or relationship with Grandmother Earth. And so, like, you could ask a young person, like, name 20 brands in a gas station. You know, it's really easy to do. And then say, well, name five plants outside. And mm -hmm. oh, and now they're stuck, you know, dandelions. They're, <laughs> you know, I don't know. But so it, it's that ability, like, seeing people walk through that spirit walk, see younger people showing older people how to use their phones, you know, like mm -hmm. the intergenerational, not just elders to youth, but youth to elders too, mm -hmm. like just seeing that passing back and forth. You know, I think it's creating good memories on the land. Like I know those younger people will remember being on this tour with their elder and showing them how to use the technology and sharing these Dakota stories together that, um, you know, that's something I want to go forward with, with um, the public art I create and so I have a new one opening up at the Arboretum, um, the Dakota Sacred Hoop Walk, and that one opens June 25th. Mm -hmm. Right now we have one stop open just to introduce it and demo it to people and, you know, show people that this is something to look forward to mm -hmm. for next mm -hmm. year. Um, and so that opens June 25th, we'll have a big event there. Um, but then I'm also working with the Caponi Art Park. They reached out from Egan, you know, they're like, we see what you're doing, we want to create something too. You know, we want to do things like land acknowledgement, but do it a lot better than just reading a paper, you know, yeah. actually mm -hmm. having people acknowledge the land as a relative from like a Dakota way of doing things. And I have like a funding from out in New York to create a documentary um, and sort of that process of how I work with a non-native mm -hmm. arts organization. But we have the same vision, we have the same goals. We just have two different ways of getting there. Um, how we work together to develop this event or this installation that will become like a community event. And then those are just, there's more augmented reality projects coming out. I can't talk about them yet, but if you follow me on social media, you see it. But I really do for me feel like this is the best thing for me because like people can hear Dakota voices, they can hear our language, they can see our artwork and they can use the land as a teacher again, yeah. you know, and that's the traditional way of how we existed. And here in Minnesota, especially the Twin Cities, you know, we have so many parks and natural places that people do go to to seek refuge that, you know, if I could show them the deeper layers that are still within these sites, you know, and do my art, you know, I feel like that will um, keep like the Dakota spirit alive and a lot more people who are living on our homelands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so um, for me, I feel like I'm like the complete opposite, right? Like I feel like um, uh, the last two years of my life have been, um, I don't want to say like crazy, but like really life changing in a lot of ways. You know, I've had a lot of um, really great things that have happened to me, but also like really uh, deep sorrow things. And um, I think for me, um, like having time to really be reflective, it was is something that like I have not been able to do. And so um, I want to use like this next couple of years to just really um, realign my like my body and my soul um, and then really think about like ways in which I can move forward um, that feels meaningful and, um, and and good for me and so um, you know I have like you know a, like a few projects here and there but um, for the most part I think I'm gonna use like this next couple of years to really just yeah, think about what I want and think about what I want to do for myself, you know, in the next, you know, five to ten years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Rest and self-care is very, very important. Yes. I think especially as, like, women of color artists, like, I think the institutions ask a lot from us. Right? Of course. We're always mm -hmm. having to advocate for, you know, the cultures, the identities that we're a part of. And so it's definitely very important to just take of a step course. back, relax. Yes. Yeah call it a day yeah of course right? yeah of course. thank you all so much yeah. for sharing tonight um very glad that we've recorded because you guys have said such powerful things and i just want to like quote everything that you guys said tonight mm. but um let's have a round of applause for our panelists